So let's take a look at refrigeration. We have a little different set of numbers. Let's use a walk-in cooler, a walk-in refrigerator. So our box temperature, let's say it's gonna cycle off at 35 degrees Fahrenheit. It's usually between 35 and 38. But if our box temperature is 35, they typically have a design temperature difference of 10 degrees. So if our box is 35, we subtract 10, our saturated temperature is 25 degrees Fahrenheit. So what we're gonna use is a different refrigerant. R22 and 410A doesn't work so great for us. So we're gonna transfer it to a different refrigerant. And this refrigerant we're gonna use is 404A. This is a HFC 404A. And why did I pick that refrigerant? Because I like it, I like that refrigerant. So we're gonna pick 404A. So our suction saturated is gonna be 25. So in your temperature pressure app, find 404A, which is usually orange, find 25 degrees Fahrenheit. If you take 404A at 25 degrees Fahrenheit, it gives you a suction pressure. The blue gauge is reading 63 PSI gauge. We need to convert that to absolute. So we add 14.7 in reality, whatever your real pressure is gonna be. But that gives you a PSI absolute of 77.7. That's our absolute pressure. That's the number we need. Now let's look at our high side. So on our outdoor, let's say we have a 95 degree Fahrenheit outdoor day. And we have a 30 degree TD or temperature difference between the refrigerant and the air temperature. So that gives us a saturated temperature of 125 degrees saturated temperature. So we take 404A, put it into our app, find 125 degree saturated temperature. And that's gonna be a pressure of 220 PSI gauge we need to convert that to absolute. So we're simply gonna add 14.7. So 220 plus 14.7 gives us an absolute pressure of 234.7 PSIA. Now that we got that number, 234.7 divided by 77.7 gives us a compression ratio of 3.02 to one. That's gonna be our compression ratio. Notice that still, that's a pretty high compression ratio. You think about this walk-in cooler, it's a very low temperature, and then we reject it outside in a very high temperature. And these refrigeration systems typically have a high TD. So that high TD makes it a lot of work. But if you notice how much work that is, it's still less than how much work you would have for a low indoor temperature with a high outdoor temperature in your residential system. But these systems are designed to work at these conditions. They design it so that they're getting the right amount of oil return. They design it so they're moving the right volume of refrigerant. And also they use a heavier or a larger horsepower compressor. The motor itself is a higher horsepower. In residential, it's typically one horsepower for every one ton of cooling. When you get into walk-in coolers, you end up with more horsepower for less tons of cooling. So they already know they're gonna have that bigger compression ratio. So systems that are designed for refrigeration are designed specifically to handle that. Plus also remember that the evaporator coil is spaced so that you will get frost at that 25 degree saturation, you'll get frost and it allows for that frost to melt without blocking airflow and it's called off-cycle defrost. But that's a walk-in cooler. Let's take a look at a walk-in freezer. Walk-in freezer, our box temperature is about zero degrees Fahrenheit. So we know we have a 10 degree temperature difference designed between the box temperature and the refrigerant. So at zero degrees minus 10 degrees ends up with a negative 10 degree saturated temperature. So our suction saturate is gonna be minus 10. Our refrigerant is gonna be boiling at minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit. How cool is that? It's boiling, changing state from liquid to vapor, absorbing heat, but it's minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit. If we take HFC 404A and we find that saturated temperature of minus 10, what pressure would that be? Use your temperature pressure chart, find it, but you should come out with about a 24 PSI suction pressure. The blue gauge would be at 24 PSI gauge on a properly operating and designed system. Now we need to add our atmospheric pressure, 14.7. So 24 plus 14.7 gets us an absolute pressure of 38.7 PSIA. So over 95 degree outdoor temperature day plus our 30 degree TD, that gives us our saturated temperature, our liquid saturated, the red gauge at 125 degree saturated temperature. So it's an HFC 404A at 125 degrees saturated temperature. Let's convert that to a pressure, and that pressure would be 220 PSI gauge. So 220 PSI gauge plus our atmospheric pressure of 14.7 gives us an absolute pressure of 234.7 PSIA. That number's already in your calculator. 234.7 divided by 38.7, that's gonna give us our compression ratio. And let's see what that compression ratio is. It is 6. 
0.06 to 1 compression ratio. That is a huge compression ratio. That refrigerant has to really get down low to that low temperature, very low volume, and then pump it up way high for the outdoor temperature. That's a big load. It's a lot of work it's having to do. So these walk-in freezers will have a much higher horsepower compressor compared to the tonnage or how much refrigerant overall it's gonna be moving. So it's having to take a lot more work, a lot bigger motor to be able to move that. But that's a 6.06 to one compression ratio. They design these systems to operate under those conditions. So it's designed to have the oil return. It's designed to have that bigger pressure difference between the suction side and the high side. So they already take that into account. Where if you had your typical residential system, it wouldn't be able to handle that. It would literally burn up. The compressor would die because it wouldn't be able to handle those conditions. So understanding that compression ratio gives you this bigger view. And yeah, there's some math to do, but overall now you have an idea of what's happening. So we talked about compressors before. We talked about the internal pressure relief valve. So all of this is going to be inside of the compressor's suction side, the low pressure side. But this is the head side, the discharge side. The red side is going to be here. It's our muffler. And then from there, we have our discharge continuing out of the compressor. But this is our internal pressure relief valve. So if the pressure between the high side and the low side gets to be too great, this opens. So again, if our compression ratio gets too high, the pressure difference between the high side and the low side gets to be too great. This opens to save the compressor so we don't end up breaking a valve or breaking a piston. When this opens, it bleeds the high side back to the suction side. What that means is the high side will drop and the suction side will go up. So our compression ratio will reduce and it takes the pressure off the pump action of the compressor. Now there's still an issue because the compressor is gonna overheat. So there's gonna be an internal thermal overload that's gonna shut down and protect it. But you can always tell if one of these is open because it's gonna sound like water running or a high pressure hiss or like a big leak. It's gonna be a noise. So when that's happening, it's not that this is bad. It's that our compression ratio has gotten too high. So you start looking at things like, is the condensing coil clean? Is this condenser fan motor moving the right amount of air? Is the condenser fan motor even working? Is our refrigerant restriction causing high pressure on one side? Is our metering device stopped up causing high pressure on this side and even lower pressure on the other side? Maybe somebody put a suction line filter dryer in and that suction line filter dryer is having a suction line block which is lowering the suction pressure and how much refrigerant we can pull in. All of these things, thinking about compression ratio, helps you understand what's happening inside that compressor and when these bust. Now when you got refrigeration, these are set at much higher pressures. So you got refrigeration system, this isn't gonna bust until the compression ratio is much larger or farther apart. In residential, it's gonna bust a lot sooner. At some point, we're gonna be talking about pump downs. We do a pump down, we're pumping all the refrigerant into the condensing coil. As we do that, we're sucking it all out of the suction side. So the suction side drops really, really, really low. And if that suction pressure drops, it's gonna drop down to say 10 or 15 PSI gauge, and the high side is gonna be really high because all that refrigerant stacked in here. When, you, when we say shut it off, if you hear funny noises, because usually this pressure relief valve, or maybe if it's a scroll, the scroll starts to uh, separate to allow that pressure to equalize. Things like this allow that pressure to start equalizing. So sometimes you can't pump that refrigerant all the way down. I hear some people say, oh, pump it down into a vacuum. Well, first, you should never have the compressor in a vacuum. But two, a lot of times before you ever get there, that pressure relief valve is going to give, or the, if it's a scroll, the plates will separate to allow that to save itself, to protect itself. So compression ratio has a lot of things going into it, and efficiency as well as operation, like when you're doing a pump down. And also if you have repairs, like the dirty condensing coil, dirty fan motor, and also a dirty evaporator coil. If I have a dirty evaporator coil, my suction pressure and suction temperature is gonna drop a whole lot lower. And as that suction pressure drops lower, it's gonna affect my compression ratio. See how all this ties together? I love refrigeration because it all connects together. As you learn another piece of the puzzle, you got another thing going together to help you see that bigger picture. Now later we're gonna be doing also recovery and recovery also fits into a compression ratio. Notice we're gonna have a separate compressor that's in a recovery machine and it's gonna be sucking the recovery out of our unit and pumping it into a tank. Well, as we take all those molecules and start forcing them into that tank, what do you think the pressure in that tank does? That's right, it starts to increase or increase the pressure. And also the temperature of that tank goes up as well. And on the suction side, as I'm pulling refrigerant out of here, what do you think that liquid refrigerant's doing? 
Well, for one, it's boiling from a liquid to vapor, so we end up lowering the temperature. So as we're sucking refrigerant out of the unit, the suction side pressure starts to drop and the temperature of that tank starts going up and our compression ratio or recovery machine starts to really struggle. There's a few things we can do to solve that. We can heat the refrigerant up in our unit, heating our compressor. Heating, heating the side up causes the pressure to go up and it keeps our compression ratio higher as well as we can cool refrigerant going into the tank. We can cool the tank down or cool the refrigerant down before it gets into that tank and that keeps the head side lower and the suction side higher so that recovery machine can move refrigerant a whole lot faster. When we get to recovery, that piece will now start to make sense, but it all ties into compression ratio, sucking in low pressure, pumping out high pressure and that pressure difference. It all ties together, it's all important. Now let's add more to it. If I haven't hurt your brain enough, let's just go one more step. What if I'm working with medical systems and I have to have my suction temperature around say minus 40 or even lower than that. Maybe it's cryogenics and I gotta be down at uh, minus 100. Well, if I'm having to have my saturated temperature even lower than that to absorb heat, that's very low that we're having to pull down to. And then we're having to reject that heat outside. It's very high it's pumping into your motor would have to be ginormous to be able to do that. And it's just so much work, it can't effectively move it all in one go. How do you think we can make that happen without having to burn up the compressor, still being able to get oil back in the suction side, but still being able to get that heat to reject that higher temperature? Come up with an idea. So what if we had our same refrigeration cycle where we're absorbing heat at minus 100 or minus 40, or some really low temperature, but instead of rejecting it straight to the heat outside, what if we rejected it into another refrigeration cycle with a entirely different refrigerant even, or the same refrigerant, or any other combination? Let's draw that out. So now what we'd have, we'd call a cascade system. So the refrigeration cycle here is absorbing that heat at a very low temperature, but as it's rejecting heat, it's not having to reject it nearly as high. Let's say it's absorbing heat at minus 40 and it's bringing it up to say 40 degree temperature here. Then we could take this system and absorb heat at that 40 degree and then reject it to the 95 degree air outside. So now we're able to use two refrigeration cycles and we're able to have a much lower compression ratio. So the compression ratio here is gonna be normal and easy to operate and the compression ratio here is gonna be normal and easy to operate. So it's called a cascade system. We're still absorbing heat and rejecting it, but in this case, I'm rejecting heat from my condenser right into another refrigeration cycle's evaporator. So I'm rejecting heat and absorbing it. Think of a relay race. We're taking it only this far, and this person takes that baton from there and takes it all the rest of the way but it's still moving heat. I'm absorbing heat, I'm rejecting heat right into another refrigeration cycle, absorbing heat, and then rejecting heat to the air outside. It's still the same thing. Now as we use CO2 refrigerants, CO2 doesn't do well with very high temperatures, so a lot of times you'll see cascading systems with CO2 and with a host of other options. Now these cascade systems are really cool, they're awesome, maybe you'll get to work with one, maybe you won't, but understanding the idea that there's always a solution. Even if you have high compression ratios, there's still solutions to those. My friend Rick sent me this really cool cascade system, so I got to talk about it. Now I didn't get time to cut this open yet, and I haven't decided if I really want to because it's so cool and it's rare to get the opportunity to play with one of these, but this is an evaporator and also a condenser all in one. So it's a cascade system. There's two refrigeration cycles. On this side would be our evaporator coil. So we have our capillary tube and our capillary tubes coming in. The refrigerant boils from a liquid to a vapor absorbing heat, and then we superheat that vapor and our suction is superheated back to the compressor. So this would be our high side or our secondary system. Then also we have our primary side here. So here we'd have our, so here in this side would be our condensing side. Here we would have our hot gas coming from our compressor and it's de-superheating and it's changing from a vapor into a liquid and then we subcool that liquid. So coming out of the condenser is our liquid line, goes to our liquid line filter dryer and then to our capillary tube metering device, which then goes to our whatever we're cooling, which is a medical in this case, and it starts absorbing heat. So we're able to have one refrigeration cycle absorbing heat from very low temperatures, rejecting heat to a warmer temperature. Then our second refrigeration cycle taking the heat from that condenser putting in its own refrigeration cycle that's rejecting heat the rest of the way. So it's like a relay race. But it's really cool to have this. Can't wait to uh, get this cut open so we can play with it. Maybe we'll show it in another video. But ideally we're thinking about the refrigeration cycle. You're thinking about compression ratio. You're thinking about all the movement of heat and different ways to accomplish that. But also there's an app called the Copeland Mobile app. And the Copeland Mobile app has 
tons of information. And if you're working with a Copeland compressor, they're gonna have information about compression ratios. How many amps you should have at this compression ratio? How much refrigerant? What kind of efficiency you're using at this compression ratio? It's called a compressor performance chart. And all manufacturers have them, and they all have various different ways of finding this information, but the Copeland mobile app makes it easy to get to. Now, I don't have an affiliation with Copeland, I just like their app. Danfoss has great and tons amount of information for their compressors as well, but it has different information. What's your suction pressure? What's your discharge pressure? Here is what your compression ratio should be. Here's what your amps should be looking like. And it's in a way to really make your job a whole lot easier. Now, you're not going to be checking compression ratio in every job that you go to, but understanding the compression ratio, understanding how it makes that system work, that's what's important. And it seems to be on just about every certification test you come across. Hopefully, this is going to help you. If not now, in the future, later on, as you're applying all these little Lego pieces, it helps build that together. You can see how TD now builds with compression ratio, and compression ratio is gonna build into other things we're gonna talk about in the future. Key point is, never stop learning.